Dean, welcome to This Is Horror. Well, thanks for having me there, except that sounds a little threatening the way you put it, but... <laughs> I know, yeah. Pro probably doesn't help that with it being so early here, I'm trying to keep my eyes <laughs> as open as possible. So maybe that adds to the kind of sinister nature of <laughs> welcoming you. But it, it wasn't a threat. It was genuinely a warm welcome. And we are so <laughs> excited to have you here. Well, I'll take that to be the truth and we'll see how this evolves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, to begin with, I wonder what early life lessons did you learn growing up in Pennsylvania? And that doesn't necessarily have to pertain to writing or creativity, but just anything that you learned during those formative years. Well, one thing I learned, which I didn't know I was learning, that uh, I would reach a point in life where I'd say, I have to get out of all this snow and ice and wind and rain and go live somewhere where there's sunshine. Uh, yeah. But I was about in my late twenties when I figured that out. Uh, one thing I learned from growing up in real poverty uh, and under the thumb of a violent alcoholic father was that I didn't want that life. Uh, and uh, I wanted to find a way to have something better than that. Not just financially, but just in the sense of order, peace, and, and a life that uh, wasn't as chaotic as my father's life was, and as our life was by virtue of being under his thumb. Uh, so that was, I think, fairly early in my life, because for some reason, I was writing stories at the age of eight. And maybe I foresaw, maybe I'm sort of psychic clairvoyant uh, something. I saw that even at eight as somehow a path out of all this. Uh, and that I certainly learned. Uh, I learned much from my mother, who was a very good person, but very sickly and, uh, and never was able <clears throat> to achieve what she wanted in her life. And I think probably I saw that as a lesson too. Uh, don't make a mistake about who you marry. Uh, and and if you do make a mistake, get out of it quickly. Uh, and she was never able to do that. And uh, I fortunately have never had to do that. I've been now married 56 years. And uh, even though my wife every year says, when I say, let's hope we're together as long more as we have been to now, says one year at a time. Uh, so right. I think that is her right attitude. Yeah, I think one year at a time and one step at a time for many things in life can just make it more manageable. And I, I think as well, that does apply to writing, you know, take it one sentence at a time, then one chapter at a time, and it can make just everything feel less daunting. That's absolutely true. And uh when when I started out, when I was eight years old, they were really short little stories written on tablet paper. Uh, and I bound them up into little bookets and peddled them to relatives for a nickel, as I've said before, and sold quite a number of different little stories until the relatives figured out that they had to bind together and, uh, and stop this because it was bleeding their treasury. <laughs> it was only nickels, but it could add up if I was very prolific, which I turned out to be. And, uh, and it was, uh, yeah, and that is a lot of things in life. Uh, uh, it amazes me when I look back, I sometimes, when people say, you've written over a hundred books and uh, I stopped counting a long, long time ago. Uh, but I say jokingly sometimes, well, uh, I think it's because uh, I uh, I know that uh, uh, I'm having a little mental block. Uh, the, the author of uh, uh, Turn of the Screw wrote 126 books in his lifetime. Henry, it'll come to me. But, uh, Henry James, is that? Henry James, yes. 
Yes. I kept thinking Henry Miller, which is a whole different <laughs> ball of life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, uh, and I, I often say, well, uh, Henry James wrote 126 books in his lifetime. I think I'd like to rather exceed that if I can. Uh, but uh, I think maybe I already have, but I've stopped counting. But yes, that's how you begin. You do. It's. I look back and it's so daunting, uh, the me who remembers who I was, to think I even wrote one. Uh, because mm. at the beginning, it seemed unimaginable that you could write one book and have it published. And to be, have been doing it this long and still having them published uh, without having to hold a gun to anyone's head, which I've never done, is, uh, is kind of uh, surprising. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of those first stories that you were writing, do you have much of a memory of the kind of stories that you did write at eight years old? And was there a particular story that perhaps got quite a reaction from your family or friends and you thought, oh, okay, this is how we affect people? Yeah, actually, it would seem like that might have happened, but it didn't. I came from a family without books in the house. In fact, books were considered a distraction from life. And as a consequence, if they had liked something, they wouldn't have acknowledged it. And I very much think they probably never read any of these. Uh, I will say uh, many years later, when I was had reached the bestseller list and had gotten to the top of it a few times, I was at a booksellers convention and I was at dinner. My publisher brought me to dinner with a number of key booksellers. And one of them was somebody who also sold collectible books. And when I mentioned these books I'd written at the age of eight, he lightened up and said, do you have any of those? Uh, that we could get quite a price for one. <laughs> I said, first of all, if I still had a copy, I wouldn't sell it. But I did remember there was always some kind of monster in it. Uh, so that I think was psychological. My father was the monster and I had to write about other monsters I could manage. But I also remembered when he asked me that, the only title I remembered now, all these decades later when this was, was a book called The Magical Puppy, which was a little story I wrote. So while I didn't even have dogs as a child, except for two very brief occasions, uh, dogs were still a fascination for me at that age. And that, I think, was interesting for me to recall. Yeah, it's almost like on some, I guess, not even psychological, but some other level, you knew that dogs would become such an important part of your life before that actually occurred. Yeah, I think so. Now, I had two, we briefly had two dogs. One, I was five or six years old, and we had a dog came called Tiny who weighed 120 pounds. My father had bought him uh, for, uh, he thought he could turn him into a hunting dog. And Tiny was tied up in the backyard on a chain, which is never the way to have a dog. Uh, they need to be with you. Uh, mm. And Tiny was exuberant, and I went out to play with him, and he wrapped his chain around my neck and was strangling me. And my, father, my mother happened to look out the window and saw it and came out and rescued me. And I had chain-link bruises around my neck for some days. And that was the end of Tiny. And I cried when we had to, Tiny had to take him away. Then we had a little doll called Lucky, who wasn't so lucky because she was sick all the time. And my mother also sent her away. Uh, so maybe it was a longing for these dogs that I had briefly, and then they mm. were taken away. Uh, which the sad thing is that also happens when you have dogs as an adult. Their lives are so brief and they get taken away. And it's the saddest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. And I know that something you've spoken about before i i wasn't planning on jumping into this now but as, as it's organically come up i mean you've referred to dogs and indeed animals as kind of messengers or, or vessels from god and i think that that's you 
you know, can, can be very true that we can see the divine in different ways. So, I mean, what kind of experiences have you had where you've seen that kind of divinity or like animals acting as an entrance of God in your life? We are, I wrote a whole book about the first golden retriever we had, uh, Trixie. It was called mm. A Big Little Life. Uh, mm. That dog so utterly changed us. I used to work even more than I do now. I would get up at breakfast, and when we had no dog, I didn't have a dog to walk. So I would have my morning I'd shower, and I'd have my breakfast, and I'd be at the keyboard at 6, 630. Uh and I would work past dinner until seven o'clock or something if I was really going. Well, the first dog we had made a change in that. Uh, first of all, I had a walker in the morning, so I wasn't getting to work at six or 6.30. I was getting to work at seven or 7.30. But bigger than that, the first dog, she would come to my desk at five o'clock and stand looking at me in this beseeching fashion. Uh, which no woman had ever looked at me that way. Uh, it was, I need you. I want you. I don't want you to be working. And if I said I was, I, well, I just, you know, Trixie lied down. I got to do this. Then she would come put her head on my lap. And then if that didn't work, she'd get up with her paws on my chair. And over the period of two weeks, she made me stop at five o'clock because I would be laughing too much. Uh, she would have inserted herself so aggressively there was no way to work anymore. That utterly changed my life and much for the better. And there were so many things I saw about her. And then one day, to cut this answer short, since we don't have a seven-hour podcast, uh, I was walking her after we'd had her for several years. And we were in a neighborhood where this, uh, this gentleman lived in a house around the corner. And he was an elderly man in a walker. And he walked himself every morning, a great distance. He would walk all over the community. And, and he was an Indian fellow. And uh, he came up to me and one day and said, do you know what your dog is? And I said, she's a golden retriever. He said, no, no, I don't mean that. He said, in our religion, which I took to be Hindu, he said, uh, uh, we have this belief that sometimes when somebody has lived a perfect, nearly perfect life and only has to live one more life on earth before moving on, they come back for their last life as a beautiful dog. Uh, and he said, oh, how do you put this? You, ha you have been uh, given uh, the, the uh, opportunity to raise her uh, in her last life. Whoa, this is a little more than I can handle. <laughs> yeah. I'm an idiot. Uh, so I don't need this kind of thing. But it really struck me that somebody completely outside my sphere would walk up to me and say that. And it really was true about this dog that by herself, uh, she changed us in many ways. So in, in a sense, they all have each one after that. And, uh, and I, I've had other strange experiences in my life, but, uh, and I write about some of them in that first book about her, but that one was the most profound. Yeah, what an utterly fascinating thing to happen. And for somebody who you'd never had an interaction with before to, to just approach you and to say that and to be so on the money as well. Yeah, it's, uh, I was very careful about uh, talking to him henceforth because I didn't know what else he might tell me about myself that I might not want to hear about. Uh, let's keep it about the dog. Yeah, that sounds safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So did, did you often run into him then during your, your walking? Yes, then? because yeah. we were all walking. Yeah, he was very sweet. And years passed, and I wrote this book about Trixie, and some years passed after that, and I got uh, contacted by his grandson, who mm. said, I read your book, and that was my grandfather. And he said he was very, very spiritual uh, grandfather. 
and often told us things that we were surprised he knew about us. Uh, and I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's, uh, you never know who's about to walk into your life. Yeah, yeah. And I understand that you too have had some spiritual experiences. And I wondered, you know, if you're thinking about that, what some of the more impactful spiritual experiences are that you've had in your life thus far? We've had, uh, my wife and I have experienced things together. And I have said, uh, and in some cases, things that we didn't know the other one was experiencing until we raised the issue. And then it was quite striking that my wife wasn't surprised the same thing was happening to her. We are not people that this happens to all the time. So uh, we were, uh, you know, reluctant to even mention it. I have said, and I'll stick by it here, that I will write about some of this one day, uh, but not until I don't care whether people think I'm crazy or not. And I'm that close to not caring. So maybe it's around the corner that I would write about them, but I'm not quite ready yet. Okay. Well, <laughs> we will look forward to that potentially happening in the future then. And hopefully you won't also simultaneously go crazy, you know, but we'll find out. <laughs> we will see. It'll be like an H.P. Lovecraft story. It will be too much to me to think about it, and I'll end up in a basement somewhere raving. But maybe not. I think I can hear that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, as much as I would like to read that, I don't want the fallout to be that you are kind of permanently confined to a basement. So as long as we can find a way to make that happen <laughs> without the it basement. Could happen anyway, whether I write about it or not. So let's not worry about it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, going back to the writing, so because you said that you were... Uh, writing from the age of eight, but I understand that a point where you thought, okay, maybe this is something I can do professionally is when you were a senior in college and you won an Atlantic monthly fiction competition. So could you talk us through that moment and the significance in terms of your writing career? Well, first you have to know that uh, in those days I was a slacker. Uh, I, I didn't make a lot of effort as a student. Uh, if, if I could write a paper and make up all the references in it, create a whole bibliography of books I consulted that never existed, I would do that. I was, I was shameless in that sense because in my whole academic career, mostly what they wanted me to read was stuff I didn't want to read. So I would fake it and I would read what I wanted to read. Uh, which is, I'm not recommending this to other students. Uh, I'm not recommending a life of academic crime, but it worked for me for quite a while. Uh, and when I was in college, uh, it was actually late in my junior year, I wrote this story, but my senior year was just around the corner. I was not an A student, let's just say that. I may not have even known what the honor roll was. Uh, I was there just because it was a place to be, and I had no idea where I was going from this. And I had worked in high school to earn the money to go to college, so by God, I was going to go. Uh, and then I wrote this story called The Kittens, and uh, uh, a professor submitted it to Atlantic Monthly Competition for College Writing and never told me. This was a small college in Pennsylvania that did this every year, all the English department was always sending student stories off. But in a hundred and some years, nobody had ever won a prize. And instead, the story won one. The great thing for me was, in my senior year, I was a star. Not because I was accomplishing anything academic, but because I'd won this award for this story. And the award was awarded at the beginning of my senior year. Suddenly, when I was getting C's and B minuses in my classes, I was getting all A's, whether I did anything or not. And it showed me the value of a certain kind of celebrity. Uh, and uh, that was interesting. And then also, uh, 
it showed me, huh, this could be a life path uh, somehow. Uh, suddenly a kid who nobody thought much of, everybody thought something of, simply because he could put words together uh, and make something of them. And then uh, there was no money in the Atlantic Flood Prize. There was just a nice certificate and a little booklet and a thank you and a pat on the head sort of thing. Uh, and so there was a magazine, I still remember it, called Readers and Writers. And uh, they invited submissions from somebody who hadn't been published before. And I sent this in. They paid me $50 for it. And that was the moment when I said, huh, because paperback books in those days were 50 or 60 cents. Now they're like $10. And so with $50, I could buy a lot of paperback books. And that was the first time I realized there might be a way to earn a living with this. Uh, and so that was a really profound moment. And that professor who submitted the story did quite a beneficial thing for me because I would have never thought of submitting a story of mine to the Atlantic Monthly. And so then after that as well, did you kind of increase, I guess, your work ethic, because you said, you know, beforehand you were, hmm, did, did you put it as a lazy student? You certainly said something that implied <laughs> things along those lines, whereas now, you know, you're one of the most prolific writers in the world. So when did that change occur? You know, I've never had the question put to me quite that way. Uh, and it makes me think about it. And I do think that was the moment where that began to occur because I started as a senior in college writing short stories in the science fiction field and submitting them to magazines even when I was a senior in college. They weren't selling when I was a senior in college. But in my first year out of college, I started to sell them. Uh, and so that was the moment where I went, I think what it was, I needed something to do that I thought had meaning because I was raised in a family and a circumstance where there was no, seemed to be no meaning to anything, where it was chaos at all times, all the time. And suddenly writing, I could control something. Uh, this is an excellent question. I wish I, I thought should have been asked about 30 years ago, but it's never been asked. Uh, and uh, that, I guess, is the moment I started to think I can control something. And what I can control is language and making stories out of it. Now, I had a high school English teacher that had been trying to tell me that through the ninth through 11th grade, but I was resistant to lessons because my self-esteem was pretty low in those days. Uh, but in college, then I started to think, okay, apply this. Look, it got you something. It got you all these high grades that you're not earning. It got you $50. It got you attention that you've never had before. And maybe there's something here. And so I guess at that moment was where the slacker, that's American slang for somebody who doesn't like to work. The slacker went away and 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 the hard worker showed up that I didn't even know was inside there. And yeah, and he's been in charge ever since. Yeah, although it sounds like from listening to you previously that whilst the self-esteem has, of course, improved to a point, the self-doubt has even now never gone away. And so each draft, each page, you will go over that you know, at least 10 times and sometimes 20 or 30. And, you know, my goodness, for writers listening to this to think even Dean Koontz is still plagued by self-doubt. It, it, it's both, you know, liberating and and marginally depressing in the sense that it's like, well, okay, that, that is never going to go away. Probably it isn't if you have that. And probably it shouldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. A little story on the side of that. Uh, when I was just beginning to break onto the bestseller list, uh, and I hadn't got anywhere near number one, but I had a book coming out called Watchers. 
And because of the couple of books before that, People Magazine wanted to do a piece. And it was in the day that they weren't all these little pieces, they were larger articles. And they sent a reporter, and then they sent a photographer a couple of days later. And the photographer, Jim McHugh, I remember him well, uh, he came for, said, I'll be here for a day. He ended up staying two days. And part of the way through the first day, he said, let's take a break. Uh, And I said, okay, because I've never been photographed for a magazine before. And I didn't know how this works. And I said, okay, sure, he needs a break. What he meant was, I need you to take a break. And we sat down, we got some coffee, and he said, uh, I'm going to tell you something about yourself. Uh, Your father or your father and your mother were alcoholics, and one or the other of them was violent. And uh, I looked at him. I had never spoken publicly about this. I looked at him and said, how the hell do you know that? And he said, you have all the behavior of an adult child of an alcoholic. You want to control me about what pictures I take. And you do it in the nicest way. You don't make it demanding, but in all kinds of subtle ways, you're trying to control the moment. And that's because as a child, you had no control at all. And you've reached a point in your life where you're saying, I'm going to control my future. And it was just the most eye-opening moment because... He was telling me something that I couldn't deny. I realized it was absolutely true, and but I hadn't seen it about myself. And in the conversation we had, I first time talked about the doubt that he had had you. And Jim McKee said to me, that'll never go away because of your childhood. And it never has. Uh, you can do everything you hoped of doing and more. And still there it is. Down there deep somewhere, you think, I don't deserve this. This shouldn't happen. This isn't who I am. And it's just something you live with. Um, And you get on top of it. uh, And some people don't. Once I started talking publicly about it, I started getting a lot of mail from people who went through that same kind of childhood, sometimes not as bad, sometimes a lot worse, and said, I've never gotten over it. And here I am 40 years old or 50 years old. And it screwed up my whole life. How did you get past it? And that made me think of another aspect of it. And I finally thought, and I went back and I said, this is going to sound terribly petty. But I said it to people, look, if if I let my father destroy my whole life, he, he, he won. And I'm not going to let that bastard win. And that's the way you've got to think about it. Uh, And it may seem petty, but that is the way you have to think about it. Or otherwise, they will drag you down forever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my understanding, too, is that later in life, you kind of spent some time with with your father. And, um, like, he was then also that diagnosed to be a sociopath but i'm wondering how did the dynamic shift when you were an adult and i mean did did you ever have conversations as well with your father about what had happened was that something that was desirable or was it better not to have those conversations well i'll try to keep this short but uh we had moved to California in part to get away from my father. My mother had died young, 53. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my father would show up at your door at two in the morning drunk and angry. And uh, it was just difficult to deal with. And finally we said, and also it was the weather. My wife said, you know, we're living in cold and rain and wet and we haven't seen the sun in 40 days. Very biblical. So uh, we got to move and we moved to California. Uh, and within a year uh, or so, uh, a friend of my father called up and said, he's destitute. Uh, he's not got more than a year to live. Uh, so that was a moment when I had to think, okay, do I just treat him as he treated me, which would be uncaring and uh, not there? Or do I have to do the opposite? And my wife, uh, bless her, said, we have to do the opposite. Now, in our defense, or in, in, 
not to make us look too angelic, uh, we didn't think he was going to live more than a year. He lived 14 years. We brought him west to California, not in our house, but in his own apartment, and took over support of him. And he got increasingly strange as this time passed. And then it came, I'm boiling this down to a lot of years of grief. And that was when he ended up in a psych ward on two occasions. And it was on the second and first psych ward, he was, uh, it was identified as uh, uh, schizophrenic, uh, complicated by alcoholism uh, with tendency to violence. Uh, but on the second occasion, they just said he's sociopathic. Uh, and at that point, he had to go into a different kind of care situation. And he made two attempts to kill me in that situation. And the second time in front of a number of witnesses, and he ended up in yet a more restrictive environment, which we were paying for. So it was all kind of a strange mm. thing. But in that whole process, there was never a moment, uh, and this may seem hard to understand. Again, this is something I've never been asked. It, there was never a moment where I could say, uh, why did you do these things? And partly that was because I realized at that point, he had no answer. If you're sociopathic, you have no answer. You're, you're basically a narcissist who only believes that, maybe not as far as solipsists, who believes he's the only real person in the world. But uh, sociopaths do believe that they're the only person in the world who matters. And uh, they're very good at faking human, human feelings. Uh, that's the key thing of sociopathy. They fake human feelings. They don't actually feel them. Uh, and at some point in that process, you realize you're never going to change this. You're never going to be able to have that conversation uh, about why. And so you just accept this is the way it will be. And you you just weather this. And at some point it will end. And at some point it did. I'm not proud of the fact, but I'm not embarrassed by it either. That on the day my father died, I went and made arrangements. It was in the morning. Uh, they called me up. He was in a very nice care facility. Uh, they called me up and uh, he was a danger to nurses and everything in this. And they called me up and said that he had passed away uh, early in the morning. So I went and made arrangements where he would be buried and got that done. It took all day to get all of this stuff cleared up. And my wife and I went to dinner together in a favorite restaurant. There were no tears, uh, but before dinner, we went into the adjacent bar and they served in this place schooners of beer, which were, I think, probably about 16 ounces of beer. Mm. And uh, in these huge uh, certain mugs they served it in. We drank a considerable amount of beer that night before dinner. We didn't eat until 10 or 11 o'clock at night because we were sharing what we had been through with my father for 14 years. There was no moment of grief because my father didn't have a friend in the world. When he died, there was no one to call out except one relative that was left and didn't care that he had died. Uh, and we sat there drinking these beers from five o'clock till 10 or 11 at night with no concern about how much we were consuming. We never had any effect from this beer. And then we had dinner uh, and uh, went home perfectly sober. That was what he'd done to us. It was like the most, it was that moment on that day was the most, I don't know how to quite explain it, but it was like all, a life of tension was being relieved, released in one night. And, uh, and then life went on. But the saddest thing about that was my mother was a good person and endured hell on earth for all those years. Uh, and all the people he touched in his life didn't care whether he came or went. That's not the way to live a life. And even when you're a sociopath, I wonder, is that something you could have done anything more to have affected? Maybe not. And that's something that has affected my writing because I write about a lot of sociopaths. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness. What 
what an experience. I mean, what, what does one even say to that, that there's not a lot that can be said, but to just, you know, listen. And I mean, I wonder too, I mean, obviously having that childhood must have been traumatic on a number of levels for you. And indeed, you know, you've spoken about how it has then affected you later in life. But when you got the kind of diagnosis and then the the explanation as to his sociopathy, did that narrative in a sense make things easier to process? I mean, it would never, of course, justify the abhorrent behavior and the things that you went through, but was there on any level a healing notion to it? There was absolutely. It gave you an explanation uh, that was different from just endless selfishness and meanness. Uh, uh, this this gave you something a little more to hang on to, in a sense, psychologically. Now, I'll back up and say it was a difficult childhood, but I was not an unhappy child. Uh, I, I had an aunt, I've spoken about this before, who knew the circumstances of our father, my mother's sister, and she would look at me. Well, there were two sides to it. She always assumed I would be just like my father. I mean, as far as the family, my mother's side of the family is concerned, he was a useless ne'er-do-well, and therefore his son was probably going to be a useless ne'er-do-well. And partly I was fulfilling that by being the lazy slacker I was in, uh, in school. And uh, But my aunt would stop me sometimes when I would be laying in the yard reading a book or I would be doing something and laughing. Uh, and she would stop and say to me, you're too happy for your own good which I always thought was such a strange thing to say. How can one be too happy for his own good? What she meant was, I think, you're, you're just like your father, essentially. And fortunately, I wasn't. But uh, I grew up, I always, as a kid, knew there were ways that you could find happiness. And the biggest way for me were books, because they I could escape through fiction that world I was living in. But there were also things like I had a wonderful uncle who I didn't get much for Christmas because we were very poor. And one year I had an amazing Christmas when I was 11 or 12. He bought me a bicycle and it was a cool bicycle. It was top of the line Schwinn. And uh, I could suddenly go all over this little country town we lived in uh, on this bicycle and be far away from the house we lived in. Uh, and that brought me a lot of joy. So I was always able to find things that br brought me joy. And one of those things early on was comedy. I, f I fell in love with Mad Magazine and its equivalents. Uh, <clears throat> I became a big fan of people like Steve Allen and so forth. And there was always a refuge in that. And that colored my writing as the years went by because I include considerable humor in a lot of books something publishers at first didn't want me to be doing, uh, but were surprised when it turned out to work just fine and didn't damage sales. So finding a way to be happy in the midst of all that was, I think, what what allowed me to survive. Yeah, and I could see, as you mentioned, Mad Magazine, Bob reacting to that. So I'm, I'm sure <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. an experience that you had too, Bob. Yeah, mad, cracked, cracked. Uh, yeah, National Lampoon. When I got a little older, uh, yeah. you know, it's uh, the humor. It's funny though, because humor and horror always seem to go together. They're the opposite sides of the same coin, and uh, so it's you see a lot of people who like horror or like you know scary things. They get into funny things, and it's yeah. just I find it very common. It's uh, well when horror became successful in the U.S. There were publishers who didn't think they those two things bound together. And when I first started doing it, it was some of the biggest arguments I had. And I'm an ar not an argumentative guy, but I can remember when lightning was delivered and there was humor in the book. The publisher was, was unable to cope and we had to 
take to argue about the book for six months before she broke down and published it. And then that became really a cornerstone of the early career. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, particularly with retrospect, seeing reactions from publishers and editors that were initially negative, but then, you, you know, you can see how, you yeah, know, maybe they should have looked at that again. I mean, for example, with Odd Thomas, my understanding is that your publisher initially hated it. Absolutely uh, hated it. He was... At a certain level in the business, uh, it's not only your editor who reads your books, but your publisher. Now, the publishers are very busy people, so they don't read everything they publish. Uh, but certain books, there's so much writing on them, they read them. And he had been supportive on the first several books, although we did have a problem over humor on Seize the Night. Uh, but when it came to Odd Thomas, it was not just the humor. It was the whole idea of this lead character who wasn't what a virulent male lead character is supposed to be. And he couldn't cope with that. And he was so distraught that they had paid what they paid me. And I had delivered this quirky, strange character who didn't use a gun. He would use a dust mop if he had to, to deal with the villain, uh, who had this quirky take on the world. And it just wasn't who he thought people who read what he thought my books were would relate to. And so my editor had to tell me, he won't, re he, he won't tolerate you writing another book with this character. And I said, oh, because after I fell in love with this character, I want to write more books with him. So we have a problem. Then the book came out, or even before it came out, uh, booksellers started reading it, and the reaction was explosive. They loved the character. They loved the books. Uh, and then the reviews started coming in. And finally, my publisher, whom I liked usually as a person, but we had our differences in our different roles within the book business, uh, he came to me. Because he, he had said, don't write me any more on Thomas and don't write me anything that isn't totally scary. And I had one more book to owe them. And I thought, okay, then I'm going to have to leave because I can't be told you must be limited what you want to write. So I wrote The Taking, which is totally scary. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of humor in it. Uh, and... Uh, then uh, Thomas went on to be very successful. And he did come back to me, the publisher, and say, I will never again tell you what to write. Let's do another contract. And, but he did say, you can write more on uh, Thomas, but you have to give me something else between each one, uh, between each of the uh, Thomases. And I said, that's fair enough. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, you have to learn, how, however, as a writer, how not to make an argument out of it. I said we argued, but we never really did. It was more a debate. <laughs> and uh, I know writers who get incensed when they're questioned in that manner. And you can't. Uh, we all have our opinions of the things. And sometimes those people are right. I haven't encountered it often when we've disagreed, but sometimes I have. And you just have to look at it and say, well, maybe this is an issue where there's some something about this that you're, I'm missing. One thing, not to go off the field, but one thing I've always noticed about editors and publishers often, and I'm in my best position ever with the people who are now publishing me, I, it's all been going so swimmingly, I'm waiting for a disaster to strike. Uh, and one thing I've noticed is a lot of times the editor or publisher will say something to you, this has to be changed, or this is wrong, and here's why. And you'll look at it and say, no, that's fundamental to this book. But one thing I learned a lot of years ago is they sometimes do sense something that's wrong and they don't know what it is exactly. So they go into this one element and say to you, this is wrong. You have to change this and address this. And when you think about it and you talk to them, 
you can find out what it is they're really reacting to. And oftentimes it is something you need to address, but it isn't the way they think you need to address it. And I found that to be the most valuable thing I've discovered as a writer in a relationship with editors. Don't always dismiss it, but don't always take it for exactly what it is. Sometimes something that I'll say and you'll say, yeah, that's right, I can massage that point. But sometimes there's something they're feeling, but they don't know exactly why and how to express it. And then it's sort of part of the writer's job to find out what that is. And sometimes they're just terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very wise advice. And I think something that many of us can benefit from and yeah, I mean, if you're getting criticism, there might be something there. But as you say, it might not be what they're telling you it is. And I guess we, we have to use our gut and our heart in times like this. And just it's probably also don't, why, don't, I, not, not to interrupt you, but it's why I always say when I'm talking to younger writers, know why you've written what you've written. Mm -hmm. Understand it on as deep a level as you can. Uh, so that you don't take the wrong advice or so you don't turn down good advice. Uh, and it's hard to do. I always know multiple reasons why I've done something. It's to advance the mood, to advance the pace, to deepen the character. It needs to have usually three reasons why key things in a book happens. And if I know why, then I know how to defend it or why I need to change it. Mm. Yes, yes. Well, we should talk about the forthcoming book, The House at the End of the World. And I mean, I know because we've spoken about this previously that you don't traditionally outline your books, but I'm wondering how much did you know going in? Because for a book that was not outlined, it is so meticulously crafted and indeed, one imagines that you must have had to do a fair bit of research for it because there's so much science packed into particularly the latter half of the book. Uh, well, you're going to be surprised. <laughs> it's, it's, I research as I go. Uh, and so what I knew, what I wanted to write was... Two things, really. One, I've written many times. In, I, I like to write because I've met a number of them in my life, and I'm married to one. Women who are so uh, psychologically strong, so uh, uh, psychologically strong, emotionally strong, that uh, they kind of make a lot of men look wimpy by comparison. Now, it's not in an obvious hammering you away. Uh, I'm not talking about that kind of woman, but I'm talking about the ones that are quiet and very strong and like China Shepherd in intensity or uh, Ashley Bell and Ashley Bell or or the disabled girl, uh, Lelani Klonk in One Door Away From Heaven. I love writing about that kind of character because I've known some and I I don't know that I've always gotten my hands around that character as much as I'd like to. And I was in a mood to write about a, a woman character like that, totally alone, uh, no one she can turn to, uh, and a lot of escalating terrible things begin to happen. Uh, then the second thing that I wanted to write about was the failure of uh, a lot of the ruling class in Western civilization that we trust with our votes, but become all about power, not about service to the people that elect them. And this is not about one political side or the other. This applies to almost all of them, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> and so I wanted to write a book that took that as the center of it. Somebody who was, who's, whose society has failed her in the most egregious sort of way uh, and has had great tragic loss. And the way she wants to cope with it is just get out of here. I want to be somewhere where I don't have to deal with the society or people. And of course, that kind of 
story where it has to go almost is you can't run away from it. It's going to pursue you because those same people are still shaping the world. You, you've got to change the world in a different way. You can't run and hide from it. That was the start of this story. So then it's, okay, who is she and where is she? Well, she's this artist, not a writer, but a painter. And I'm a, I'm a big art collector. Uh, and I wanted her to be the kind of painter I really admire. Uh, the one who book, uh, bucks the impressionist, the abstract thing, and really does an old fashioned kind of work, which is hyper realism. And that also fits her character very well because she's going to have to get hyper real to survive what's going on. Uh, so that that sort of gets built out of the character. And then she's going to have to be on this island where she can't turn to help at all. And then because of her loss, uh, she has to she has to have the damn it no attitude. I'm not going to succumb to this. Uh, and also at some point in the story somebody's going to have to come into it that she's responsible for it, uh, and I won't give anything away. And now she's going to have to step up to the plate. It all kind of got built out of that character and my sort of frustration with looking at the world and the way our health establishment mismanaged COVID so entirely. First, max, masks will save you. Masks will not save you from a virus. That's just so on the surface of it stupid. Uh, and all the other things that eventually they backed away from. And all the things you look at society and see how the people you trust fail you on. I wanted a book about that and and how they would fail you in this book on a potentially catastrophic level. So when she comes there having lost what she's lost, and I take a long time to let the reader know what that is, I play that out as a suspense element. Uh, but then when you know what it is and how awful it is, uh, that it's not just a simple tragedy, uh, then the bigger issue of what may be lost if what's happening on this island and the island next door is not dealt with uh, becomes, it all explodes into a, another level. And then of course I had to do a lot of research, uh, but for the kid in college and high school who hated doing research, it amazes me that it's one of the things I like the most uh, now because, and it, that becomes because readers make you do that. If you get something wrong, you get mail from specialists in the field mm -hmm. who take you to task for it. And then you're humiliated. And I don't like humiliation because I grew up as a kid humiliated about everything because of who my father was and how poor we were. So I have to do all that uh, research, but I kind of love it. And it gives a lot of authenticity to a story which is pretty out there in its way. Mm. Uh, but it, it helps you feel this this might actually happen. So I think I've answered your question, or maybe I went far afield. I, I think that that's a brilliant answer. And I'm just wondering, you know, since you're writing and researching simultaneously, what does that logistically look like? I mean, when you're at your computer and you're writing, if you get to a bit and you know, okay, this is going to require some research, do, do you immediately then like open an internet browser or is it a case of putting some placeholder text in and returning to it at a later date? I, that's interesting too. You're asking questions never asked before. So uh, <laughs> the, I think what I have most of my research I do out of uh, books and periodicals, although that is insufficient anymore. I, I have a very large library uh, and I know what to find in anything of it. Uh, and I, I also have a Rolex on which I have the names of uh, quite a number of uh, people in the sciences. Uh, it, it's, I've actually given endorsements to books by physicists and biologists uh, who've, I, first time that happened, it surprised me they asked for it. I said, you don't want a, a guy who writes fiction putting an endorsement on the book. Oh yes, because uh, it will open the audience uh, 
the rest of the guys on the back of the book will all be scientists, but you will be the one who's not. But it's because they know I do this kind of research before I write. Then, because I do not go online, I know I'm an obsessive compulsive personality. And once I get online, that might be the end of my writing. I would be surfing the, the net for the rest of my life. So when mm. there's something I can't find and I need it urgently, I go to Linda who connected this, who's sitting mm. here in case something goes wrong and I won't know what to do. Uh, <laughs> and I say, here's what I need to know, find it for me. Meanwhile, I can go back to the writing and she'll find me four times what I need. But meanwhile, I'm back writing around it. And what you said is, normally I'm asking for something I see coming 10 or 20 pages ahead. So I can continue to write where I am. And then when I've got everything I've asked for, I can stop, read it, think about it, and see how this affects us. If not, yeah, I can put a placeholder in for a few facts or something else and then write around it. But uh, that's, that's sort of how it goes. And it's... Uh, but the internet is an incredible resource. Uh, when I was doing the Jane Hawk books, I would, I would say to an assistant, let's go on to uh, Google Street to this place mm. and show, I want to come and sit there and look at the whole. And that made it possible for me to set scenes in places I hadn't been. But now I could go see exactly what they look like. And I found that just fascinating. And it really enhanced scenes that otherwise wouldn't have been as real and vivid as they were. So uh, so it's, it's all wonderful now. It's, it's a great new resource for writers. And, but I use it all in my own way. Yeah, it's so fascinating how having Google Street does enable us to visit places we just would not have visited. I mean, we could literally tour the globe in an afternoon going around these various places. But it's interesting too, because it means that when you're depicting a city, in a sense, there's no excuse to get the details wrong because you've got it there. But then on the other hand, you know, many writers, they they take creative license. So, I mean, you could see someone like Lawrence Block and it's like, well, this is my interpretation of New York. This is not a kind of absolute factual New York. And I mean, when you're doing that with your fiction, particularly if there is a real place, how important is it for you to get all the details spot on and how important is it to say well you know what this is Dean Koontz's world this is not you know an actual interpretation it's uh that's the point at which you have to you have to decide it's a case-by-case -case situation it makes me think of a book I have coming in July called After Death uh, and it, it's a whole new take on the idea of the synchronicity uh it, it takes the idea that the synchronicity will not produce superhuman. <laughs> it, it's going to it's going to be more limiting than that. And in it, there is a sequence that takes place in an apple orchard, a vast apple orchard, as there used to be in California before uh, we we had certain incredibly stupid political decisions made. Uh, and you would go into orchards that were miles uh, on a side uh, that were vast. And if you're up in the Central Valley now, where the water that fed the Central Valley, which produced 60% of the fruit and vegetables for the world at one time, and now it doesn't even produce all of them for the country, because the water that comes into the Central Valley has been denied the Central Valley uh, for all kinds of reasons. So now you can go to orchards of almond trees that are dead uh, and that aren't worth cutting down because there's nothing to do with the land because the water isn't there. Well, uh, I don't know if any of those are apple orchards, but I do know they have almond orchards and stuff. And my characters weren't in the Central Valley. They were further south toward San Diego, but they're 
I just decided, okay, this is my California. <laughs> and so there's this giant apple orchard where all the trees are dead. And there's going to be this amazing sequence in it, in, in a rainstorm where our, our, our female lead is pursued by a lot of gangbangers in multiple vehicles in this. And she has to rely on our male lead at some point, but he's elsewhere. And she and her son have to take care of themselves till he can't. And it's one of the most, for me, it was one of the most exciting sequences I've ever written. And it's quite lengthy. Uh, and that apple orchard is a fabulous setting because all the trees are dead and the ground is getting saturated from the rain. And it's, it's both a comic and a suspenseful sequence because the idiots chasing her are not the brightest people in the world as criminal generally or uh, And so it has all those elements that I like most in the scene. So yeah, that was, you know, somebody who lives here goes like, hey, is there an apple orchard like being in the San Diego County area? No, but there are other apple orchards there and some of them may be dead. Uh, so yeah, you just have to make those decisions. And by the way, I'm a Lawrence Block fan. So, uh, so I wouldn't want him to write New York any other way than he does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Such mm -hmm. a phenomenal talent. And, you know, not, not only is he a great fiction writer, but there's so much that writers of any age can learn about the craft of writing through him. He's written so many columns, so many books on it. And yeah, such a great guy. Yeah, he, uh, he started out, you know, working in the Scott Meredith Literary Factory, I think, that was an agent. And, uh, and there were a number of writers at that time that were just exceptional writers. Donald Westlake, uh, Lawrence Block, they were friends, uh, Brian Garfield, they all sort of came out of that same little New York knot. And each one of them did exceptional work, uh, which is kind of fascinating to me. Yes. Anyway. Oh, oh, to me too, and I'm sure to Bob also. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But I know that we're coming up to the time that we have together today, so I do want to get to some questions that have been submitted from our patrons. But, I mean, but before we move on to that, I just wanted to check with Bob, is there anything from the house at the end of the world that you wanted to jump into that we didn't cover or indeed an, another topic at all because I'm very aware that to say I have dominated this conversation <laughs> might be <laughs> might be an understatement. No, the, the the only thing that, that that's coming to mind is and, and you did touch on this is the the pacing is is impeccable and that's that's something that that I've always kind of wrestled with in my own writing. And I know that you you don't outline, um, and I'm sure that every project is probably different in 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 a lot of respects. But a lot of the things kind of carry over from project to project. And I just it's like without without having any type of outline and things like that. How how do you how do you get that that you know keep building that suspense? It's like hey, this everything is interesting. I want to know more. And you piecemeal the stuff out and it, it forces you to turn the pages. It's like, okay, I've got to, I've got to, and it's like, I want to get to that point. And I know there's no magic formula, but maybe you have any type of tip or anything like that, that you could pass along. That would be, you know, excellent. Well, uh, partly uh, uh, it goes back to that self doubt and terror of losing the reader's interest. Uh, but also I did something, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how obvious it is, but I did something different in this book than I'd done before. Uh, I, I, in the next book, After Death, I've done, I've approached the same way. Uh, and it's a little hard for me to articulate it because I'm still getting my head around it. Uh, I, I, first of all, part, this is not so fundamental. This is just sort of a design thing. I stopped, in this book, I decided not to number the chapters. Uh, I gave them titles. I've given titles chapters, or chapters titles before, but 
I've also numbered them. And this time, I just decided to title the chapters and also to not treat the past and the present the way that I've always treated them before in, in a novel, which was you start to tell something about a character's past within the context of the present when the story is unfolding. Or you do a classical flashback, which maybe you put in italics or something. I just decided past and present, you go back to what quantum mechanics tells us, uh, what T.S. Eliot told us, uh, past, present, and future are all present in the present. They're all one. Uh, and that is essentially true. Science tells us all of time was present at the Big Bang, at the moment of the Big Bang. So I thought, why don't I write a book like that? If I want to tell you something about the character's past, I don't do it as a flashback. You turn the page as a chapter. It just happens to take place in the past. Yet, but it's also dramatic. And as a consequence, without having to say, this was in the past, or this was this, or that was that, you just bring the reader to it, and there it is. And you keep it succinct. Uh, and dramatic, and some of these are a couple of pages, but it gives you that, and especially when you're, I'm, I've held out from the reader exactly what is in her past, this made her want to give up the world. And when you get to it, it's given to you in little big pieces in between all the rest. And I think as that unfolded for me, it brought a lot more power to some of those things. Whereas in the past, I might have stopped and given you her past as an extended five, eight, ten page thing, maybe broken up into two pieces. Here it's broken up into pieces about the bad guys, and you still don't know what they've done, but you meet them, and it's taking place in the past. And I just treated past and present differently, and I probably shouldn't give that up, but it, it, I think it did what you like in it. it. It got that pace in the way that doing traditional flashbacks or talking about a character's past doesn't give you. You automatically start to slow down a story. But in this case, by treating those moments as if they're part of the action, they just have taken place in them. That's really what it is. You've made me think. You guys have made me think more than I like to. More than I don't. <laughs> But that's what it does. It makes you treat the past and the present as if they're all happening simultaneously, mm -hmm. but without saying it. Uh, and so when you go to that past moment, it's treated like an action scene. And, and it gives it to you in a burst and you go, whoa, these, you know, the two pages I learned about these bad guys and things that are doing. And, and it feels like an action sequence, but it's actually the past and how this character's past was destroyed, how her life was destroyed. But it's treated like action. And in the after death, I did the same thing and had enormous amount of fun with it. Uh, and I think I'll be doing a lot of that in the future. The thing that's tricky about it is not confusing the reader, uh, not saying, wait a minute, where is this? Uh, without bluntly telling them. Now, I've also delivered a very funny novel. I think it's the funniest thing I've done since Life Expectancy, but it's also a suspense novel. Uh, and in this novel, I did, I did the same thing, uh, except it's a different kind of novel in that it's very funny. It was laugh out loud to me as I was writing it every day. And my agents, it's their favorite book, I think, that I've ever done. Uh, and uh, But it's also very gripping, I hope, in its way. And in that one, I ran into a little different problem with this technique. Not, I hope I'm not going on too long with this, but I, I found out that I did have to, have to keep the reader apprised of where we were in a way that I didn't have to do so boldly in uh, the house at the end of the world or after that. And it was because the story was... Uh, somewhat more complex, and because of the humor in it. And when I would go to the past, I developed this little thing. The title would be 
uh, because it is a comic novel, I could get away with this. The character's name was Benny. Well, ben, this is not exactly what happened, but, but while well, Benny was recuperating from fighting for his life in, in this place, he took time to think about his past at the boys' school. <laughs> and then I give you the past at the boys' school, and you've got it in the title of the chapter. So I'm having a lot of fun with these new things. And that's what I think we were talking about earlier a little bit. It's what's great about this. You never stop learning. You, if you press yourself, there's an infinite number of techniques to use to uh, to grab the reader. And I think if I can still write when I'm 90, I'll be finding it just as exciting uh, and new things to bring to it as I have found thus far. Yeah, that's that's... That's interesting. And I, I did notice that. And, you know, here's the thing. It's not drawing that there were no chapter numbers. I thought yeah. it was very refreshing that we had chapter headings and uh, it, it, it's, it's, it all, it flows. It flows very, very well. But if you would have never said that it didn't have chapter numbers, I would have told you that it had chapter numbers because we're so <laughs> used to that you know, in, mm -hmm. in reading. And so and it's like, as soon as you said, it, I was like, Oh, well, they don't do they, you know, but it, it makes sense. And there's an immediacy there that, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that is kind of, eh, it's kind of opening up some things there, you know, in the old mind. Yeah, you're right. We all, we can't, we have to constantly learn. And if you open yourself to sometimes, chapter titles that are a little longer than normal, you can use, in this technique, you can use that title to plunge the reader into something right. that might have taken a paragraph at the beginning of a chapter. It's, I'm still exploring this, but it's really an interesting way to go, and I'm not quite sure where it came from, but, uh, but it was the way I started writing the book, and I thought, this kind of works. Yeah. Yeah, I think a well-crafted chapter title is a story in and of itself and perhaps my favorite chapter title because it conjured up so much in terms of imagery but also just in terms of making me think was an artist is a mathematician who knows the formulas of the soul and when I read that I thought oh boy that is a perfect <laughs> chapter title right there well, for those who haven't read the book, it, it, it goes back to a point in our lead character's childhood. Uh, and it's, the, it's just another thing, because that is, that is an incident that you couldn't have put into a, a, into a suspense novel in a normal way. Because how would you finesse that little thing that happened, or she did when she was a child, that tells you a lot about who she is? and how smart she is, and how she can intuitively know how the world works, which becomes very important to her staying alive. And, uh, uh, but by just being able to plug it in as a moment with an interesting chapter title that makes you go, huh, I have to know what this is about, uh, then it sucks you into that title as a flashback, shown as a flashback, I don't think it would have. So yeah, I'm well, I'm glad that it, the title got you. That's what it was meant to do and make you think, what is this about? Uh, <laughs> and then you're, and that's about something you wouldn't have thought you were going to be reading about, but it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think people who have been reading your work for a long time should know, never say this is something we won't be reading about because people <laughs> over the years, they've tried to put you into different genres, but you're always full of surprises. And I think that's what, you know, makes it so interesting. We don't know what book we're going to get from you. We don't know what genre, we don't know what subgenre. And as you've proven here and proven before, we don't even know what chapter within a book we're going to get. It's, uh, well, that particular chapter, I have to tell you, after my wife, who was the first reader, uh, she knows how incompetent I am about household chores and craft. Uh, 
she came to me at the end of that and said, how the hell did you know to, how to do this? And I said, do you see research? Right? And yeah. she said, I'm going to make you start doing things around the house, which is the danger of doing the research. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, let, let's hope that you avoided doing that for the time being anyway. <laughs> got to be I, careful. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I can pay. I can pay for a plumber, so... Uh, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, if if you have the time, can we take a few of the Patreon questions? I know that now we, we, we have exceeded the time that we were meant to have together, perhaps. Well, let's, let's do a few questions. I don't want to cheat your patrons there, so... Okay, so Luke would like to know... Have you ever had an idea for a book that you loved, but that felt too horrific to write? <laughs> it's, it's never been a consideration. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, no, I mean, intensity is pretty horrific. Uh, and mm. uh, what I've always felt is how you write about the subject. Uh, you can take the most terrific kind of material, but you can write about it in a way that's moving and touching and involving and not so horrific that it turns the reader off. I am not a blood and guts writer. Uh, mm. And uh, I can remember early on in the career, uh, I would be doing book signings and people would come up and they would say, oh, I love your books, but sometimes some of the violent scenes are almost more than I can handle. And I would listen to this and I, for a while it baffled me. And then one day I said, I started saying to people, tell me a scene you're talking about. And in one book signing, I had several people specify the same scene. And it's a scene in Watchers in which uh, a hired killer kills a scientist. It's pretty early in the book. And he kills her with a hammer. Uh, and I said to this person, I said to the, several of these people, okay, tell me how long do you think that scene is? How long does it take that scene to unfold? Not the killing itself, not the killing itself, not when you know he's going to do this. Then he goes and gets a hammer and then he thinks about it. And then he comes in and he does it. It's not from the moment you know this is going to happen, but from the actual killing. How long do you think that takes? Oh, it's so horrific, the first one said. It's like two or three pages. It's one sentence, actually. It's that he picked up the hammer and struck her, destroyed her left knee. Eighty-some blows later, she was dead. That's it. It's actually two sentences. That conjures in the mind something so horrific that you couldn't have written about it at greater length and made it more powerful. It's all the tension of building up to it that makes you think you've read something more horrific than you actually have. I never write a lot of blood and gore in things. So that's why I don't think I'd back away from a subject particularly because it would be handling it in such a way that let your mind conjure it all, rather than my mind giving it to you in too much detail. Right. This is a perfect example of less is more and letting the reader fill in the blanks. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Sorry. No, that's it. I'm waiting oh, for okay, the okay. follow <laughs> Okay, great, great. So John Shank would like to know, Will you ever re-release how to write best-selling fiction? No. <laughs> uh, basically, because half of it is still accurate and half of it is ludicrously stupid. The publishing business changed dramatically uh, in all the years since then. I would have to rewrite it from the ground up. Mm. And then certain other things I wrote in it, I would want to qualify substantially. I may at some point write about writing, uh, but uh, 
not not yet. And I would encourage people not to take all of that book too seriously if they get their hands on a copy of it. Mm, okay. Now, Larry Torre would like to know, and, and this may be an impossible question to answer, of all your books, which ones are your favorites? Uh, that is almost impossible to answer. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, would, I get asked that uh, from time to time. It, yeah. as, as you just said, there, there's so many different kinds of books. I can say intensity would be one of them, but so would life expectancy. And there could be hardly two different, more different books than those mm -hmm. two. They have things in common, meaning suspense and uh, whatnot. But one's a comic novel and one manifestly is not. Uh, so it, it gets very difficult. Uh, uh, a major newspaper here is planning to do some piece on me and uh, sending a reporter and I get sick to death talking about myself, uh, and uh, unless it's different like this, because you have come up with things I've not been asked, and it's interesting because I'll continue to think about them, and it mm. will have a great impact. But uh, uh, I was asked, but a, the reporter has read several books in preparation, wants to be sure she has read the five or six that you think are your best, and you think, five or six, they're more than that are my best. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you can't say, well, here's 25. So you have to think, okay, here are different uh, things that I've written. Uh, and I like them, let's put it that way. Uh, but from the corner of his eye, Odd Thomas, Life Expectancy, uh, Intensity, uh, there are just a number of them that I still like. A lot of the early books I wish... I hadn't kept in print. And some, as I get in the, over a few years, I probably will, but quietly slide out of print. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, it's, uh, it's a career. It's everybody learns. You start. Uh, you don't always do the best you can do in the early days. And even later, sometimes you go and miss. Uh, but they're all children. Uh, and if they were real children, I wouldn't just kill one of them because I didn't like how he had turned out. Uh, so uh, I will uh, I will not diss some of the ones I like less by not uh, not including them in my favorite list. Yeah, and we're glad that you've confirmed that you would not kill a child if anyone was <laughs> wondering about that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's people who've been wondering, so now that we've put that <laughs> Yeah, we've cleared it up now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Daz Eek says, I've read that you are enchanted by the English language. What writers, past or present, have enchanted you with their use of the English language? Well, Dickens was a powerful influence. But what's funny was we were assigned Dickens to read in high school and in college, and I never did. I always just faked it and got through. And then I was, I think, 30 or something, and I thought, well, I've got to see what this is about, and picked up uh, A Tale of Two Cities and uh, was just utterly captivated. I had to read all of Dickens in the next month. Uh, and I remember when I got to the end of that book, it was like three in the morning and I was sitting up in bed reading it. And um, my wife woke up and I was in tears at the end of the book. Uh, it's one of the most moving last scenes in a book you can imagine. And uh, the, the drunken attorney who goes to the death of the guillotine in the name of the man, the, the woman he loves is going to marry. <laughs> And it's just astonishing ending that he pulls off. And uh, so I, I became increasingly aware of Dickens' use of language. John D. MacDonald, an American suspense writer, was uh, commanded language exceptionally well in a more subtle kind of way often. Uh, Cormac McCarthy, an American writer, especially the early books, uh, I just, I, I actually delayed reading The Road and I haven't, uh, read um, No Country for Old Men, although I think I have to because 
uh, I noticed that style had changed. And, but The Road is just as magnificent as some of those early books like Blood Meridian and The mm-hmm. Orchard Keeper. And those. But those books, the use of language is just, or his border trilogy is just magnificent. Uh, and there's just a lot of them, people in, in, uh, in all kinds of fields. It's, it's one reason I like writing in cross-genre books is because every genre offers you people, Ray Bradbury, uh, for instance, uh, who are of great value. And the idea that great value only occurs in literary fiction is, is, is more than a misconception. It's a myth. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, as a consequence, uh, all of those writers and more than I could ever find time to mention uh, have had a profound influence on me. Mm. Well, we will have to cut off the Patreon questions there because we have more than overshot the time that we've had together. But thank you so much for being generous with your time. And I mean, we, we'd love to talk to you if things align for after death as well. We can see if that works out. But whether it does or doesn't, I'm certainly really intrigued to read it. You've already sold me on it. Well, because this has gone so well, I am totally available anytime for you. And we'll, we'll do this again. And I'll try to be coherent uh, and not be repetitious. We'll see how that works out. We can maybe get it done in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. We will see. But yes, and very best of luck for the release of the new book. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Uh, No, you've kind of just opened a faucet in my head and drained my brain here in this. At this time, I can hardly think clearly now. So I think I've said about everything I should say, except I'm very grateful for all those people who have bought the books over the years and keep doing so. And it's a very different publishing world from the, the mass market paperback has all but disappeared. And, and the ebook hasn't totally replaced it, but there are still all those ways to get books. And in the end, they, they, they keep coming back. And it's, uh, it's grateful because I have no idea what else I can do. As anyone from my assistant setting off screen to my wife in another room can tell you, there's nothing else I'm capable of doing. I'm the most incompetent human being in other factors of life. So thank God this works. Mm-hmm.